Welcome, and thank you so much for your patience as we um, waited for people to trickle in in the afternoon. I know this room can be a little hard to find, so thank you all for, for joining us. I am Aria Cochran, Director of Communications with the Waterfront Alliance, hosting the conference here today, so thank you all for coming. Um, you are here for the Changing the Narrative panel, the role of coalitions to uproot the spread of misinformation. Um, today I've got with me, of course, myself, um, <laughs> Julie Tai, who's president of the New York League of Conservation Voters and the New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. Um, her priorities for the Con League of Conservation Voters includes expanding the use and production of renewable energy, greening the transportation sector, and reducing waste. I've also got Mark Weiss here, a co-founder and steering committee member of New York Renews, a statewide coalition of almost 400 organizations founded in 2015. In recent years, at the, as the fossil fuel industry has ramped up gaslighting and greenwashing campaigns designed to slow implementation of climate law, Mark has worked with multiple organizations to spotlight those efforts, most recently with Shut the Fossils Up. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you for joining us, and we will kick off today's panel with our first question. We'll just jump right in. Um, so I'll, I'll start this one for Julie. Um, what are the common misconceptions or myths about renewable energy that hinder community adoption, and how has it impeded the uptake of alternative energies? Sure. So first of all, thank you for having this conversation because it is an issue out there. There's a lot of misinformation some of which is legitimately this is a new industry people aren't familiar with it uh, a lot of it though and i think mark will get into this more is deliberate misinformation that's being put out there into the universe to try and help slow slow adoption of uh renewable energy um really with on the offshore wind front we've seen primarily uh, a few main topics that have been uh, at the forefront in the public's mind um, we were just talking about whales for example Wales was in the, the press a lot in 2023. Um, we don't see that as much so far in 2024, um, but there have been a lot of concerns from uh, the public, um, and this is going back a number of years, about impacts on offshore wind development on marine mammals, um, including whales. So that is definitely something that has been of concern. I don't think it's been as effective in in really slowing things down in New York as it has per se in, in New Jersey, for example. Um, but that has certainly been something that has been in the public's mind um, out there, in, in particular, again, New Jersey, Long Island, a little bit less so in New York City. Um, there have been a lot of questions and concerns about EMF, um, which is something that people are concerned about coming from the transmission line that go through their communities. That has made people concerned about the health of their children, of their neighbors, of seniors. Um, so that is something that has been a topic that has come up a lot, including from extraordinarily wealthy people who should know better, um, as well as from you know just you know Joe, average New Yorker who doesn't have as much access to information and resources to be able to protect that. And that is something that has been a question that people have had um, in communities where transmission lines are going to be coming through. Um, certainly, we have had a lot of questions about costs. And I was, I was um, a little shocked last earlier this year when they talked about the price difference for the Sunrise Wind Project, uh, which is going to be on Long Island. It's going to be our first really, really big commercial scale project, 924 megawatts. Um, and it was like, the price is going to double. And you know what that price per dollar, price per month was going to be? Two dollars, <laughs> right? And so having a headline in Politico that said the price was doubling versus the, you know, the pr your, your incremental price is going to go up two dollars a month, I think is really something that was quite shocking and it's really was not even in Newsday. I was, the most shocking part was Newsday <laughs> was more moderate than Politico, very unusual, <laughs> particularly because the Newsday reporter is usually very much uh, sort of anti-offshore wind. Um, and there's been a lot of questions about fishing impacts. Um, you know, Long Island in particular has a big fishing industry. It's a hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars industry. Um, and there are questions that people have about impacts on the fishing industry. And there is partly that's coming from two different angles, right? The commercial fishermen and the recreational fishermen have different perspectives on this. So it's really on the commercial fishing side that there have been questions. I'm here to tell you that in New York, the turbines are going to be one mile apart from each other. 
Um, I've seen that in real life. They're very far apart. If the commercial fishing boats can't make it between those boats, <laughs> I'm a little concerned about how much drinking they're doing on those boats, <laughs> right? Because it just they're, they're so far apart, it just doesn't seem like that's realistically an actual problem, especially when there's been a lot of attention paid to protecting the most sensitive habitats, making sure there's limited disturbances while they're in construction, and of course afterwards there will be less issues associated with that. So um, it has been interesting to see, there's been very different dynamics in different communities since we've only had really a few communities where offshore wind is advancing, right? Out east, it really was EMF and super rich people not wanting to have their beach closed and their road dug up, um, but it's all done now and you would never, you never even know that it's there except for a manhole cover. So it's really trying to sort of get through um, some of these issues, but those are I think the main offshore wind, you know, sort of misinformation that is out there. Mm -hmm. Reliability, but I think Mark's gonna talk about that more. <laughs> <laughs> Do you wanna add anything or? No, not, not to the yeah. offshore wind, Julie's really the. Yeah, she's she's she, covered the yeah, gambit there. She's the expert on it, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll Lump the next question to you then, Mark. Um, how do fossil fuel-backed narratives influence public perception of renewable energy, and what strategies can coalitions employ to counteract this influence? So I always like to know who I'm talking to, so could we just do a quick show of hands? How many of you live in New York State? Almost, well, quite a few. How many <laughs> of you have heard of uh, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, CLCPA? Pretty good number. And then finally, uh, how many of you have seen ads, whether on TV or social, social media or flyers mailed to your house or anything um, from organizations with clever sounding names like New Yorkers for Affordable Energy or Smarter New York Energy, which are basically, has anybody seen anything? Just a, just a handful, okay. so. I'm going to, so the topic of the panel is changing the narrative. So let me just start by saying, you know, there's a, there's a reason that human beings have been telling each other stories for millennia. Because stories are how we understand the world and how we understand our place in the world and our relationship with other other parts of the world, whether they're human or animal or uh, flora and fauna. So narrative is a, is a kind of a modern use of really what we're talking about is what stories get told and as a result of which stories get told, how do we interact, how do we act, how do we think this is important, this is not important, how do we get alarmed, how do we get mobilized? So in New York State, um, both in the run-up to the passage of the CLCPA, which was 2019, almost five years ago, in a couple of weeks will be the anniversary of when it was passed, and then the, the competing narrative, sorry? Oh, sorry about that. No, you're good. Just being real relaxed here. Um, <laughs> So there, there are kind of two competing narratives um, about the climate crisis and about solutions to the climate crisis. So as Aria mentioned, New York Renews came together as a coalition in late 2015, early 2016. Before New York Renews came on the scene, there wasn't really a dominant narrative. There were there were some things being done on the climate front. There were some uh, environmental organizations that were getting uh, fragments of policies passed around transportation, around um, you know a variety of other solutions. But one of the things that New York Renews set out to do when we were created was to create a narrative, to actually begin to tell the story that there's a crisis happening that we have to address it at a much, much higher scale than we've done so far, and that we need comprehensive solutions. So the CLCPA, which we had a very strong hand in drafting and moving through the legislative process, 
took us about three years, but part of the work that we were doing over those three years was building that narrative and making it public. And I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail. The, the interesting thing was that the fossil fuel industry wasn't really, wasn't really intervening in an active way to try and stop the bill from passing. And I, I don't know exactly why, maybe they didn't think it was gonna pass, but once it passed, it was like waking a sleeping giant. Because um, as we all know, the fossil fuel industry has very deep pockets. So how do you change the narrative? One way you change the narrative is the, what New York Renews does, which is building a bottom-up grassroots mobilization, uh, tapping into our networks, reaching out to people who can be influential, trying to get the New York Times to write an editorial, trying to get the senators from New York to write public letters, but also showing up in Albany multiple times with hundreds of people and saying, meeting with legislators, meeting with the governor's office and saying, this is a crisis, we need to act as if it's a crisis. The fossil fuel industry, of course, doesn't have a grassroots base. What they have is money. And money will buy you a lot of power and influence to change the story. So what they've done in the five years since that bill was passed was you know, they're doing their normal behind the scenes lobbying, which isn't very visible to most of us, but it's to the tune of millions of dollars. Um, and they're doing a, a lot of public facing advertising um, in all media. And mostly those ads are built around, they've done focus groups, they've looked at what are people gonna be most responsive to and the three words that they come back to over and over again are affordability, reliability, and choice. It's not gonna be affordable for us to do this transition or to do it as rapidly as the law says we need to. It's gonna undermine, the grid is already unreliable and this is just gonna make it more blackouts and brownouts uh, because if we try to electrify everything, there's not enough power in the grid to keep that all going. And choice, of course, is the, you know, they're going to come for your gas stove. Um, so they're relentlessly pushing that messaging out. And um, mostly it's tied to contact, tell Albany, don't leave us in the dark. Tell your legislator, tell the governor, we don't want Bill, L, Bill A, Bill C, Bill D passed. Julie and I were talking before the panel started. There's a bill now in the state legislature, two weeks left of a legislative session. It's called New York Heat, which would provide for a, an orderly transition off of gas onto electricity for heating and cooking. And it's over a 30 year time frame, right? It's very well considered, very well thought through, and built into it are very, very serious affordability features. For example, it would put a cap on utility bills at 6% of people's annual income, family ha household annual income. It also would end what's, what ratepayers are paying for now, which is hundreds of millions of dollars a year that the gas companies have to do to keep their pipelines intact because some of these pipelines are decades old deteriorating rapidly, and it also provides for how those things can be replaced over a period of time and support families as they need to, as they need to turn to electric appliances. So the industry has been all over this. Uh, the bill passed the state senate <coughs> a couple of months ago, and it's held up in the state assembly and so the ads are very much directed to vulnerable assembly members. And uh, <coughs> I'm gonna wrap this up in a second, so I'm just gonna allude to one of the things that the coalition is trying to do, New Yorker News is trying to do, is obviously we're mobilizing people. Tomorrow is a, uh, is a, is a day for people to rally in Albany, specifically around this bill, New York Heat. But some of us in New Yorker News have created this uh, project campaign called Shut the Fossils Up, which is really an attempt to use humor to break through the noise. We don't have anywhere near the resources the industry has. We can't run 
you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of ads. <laughs> Millions. <laughs> Millions. But starting tomorrow, we're going to start releasing videos that have been created by what we call a, a creative cohort of about 15 social media creators. That'll be a combination of videos and memes, uh, some of which are, uh, most, of which, most of them are very, very funny. So we hope that they'll be shared. Uh, we don't hope. We're working on that process. <laughs> we don't, hope, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> um, but in a, all of these things are meant to go, you know, to go viral, and we have a number of ways that we're going to try and make that happen. Um, but they're also about changing the narrative, because many of them are pushing back at all the messaging that the industry is doing. So that does the name shut the fossils up, which obviously the name itself, there was a laugh earlier when that was, that's the whole point, right? This is something that's not the gloom and doom that the climate movement, uh, you know, often has to go to to kind of wake, feel like we have to wake people up. It's actually easier to wake people up with humor than it is with doom and gloom. So anyway, I, I don't want to monopolize the narrative. There's, there are other <laughs> questions we need to get to, but that's kind of the overview of where we are. No, I think that's a really, really smart tactic. I don't know if anybody read that article from Distilled about two years ago where they um, went in and did research on a bunch of different Facebook groups who were um, anti-offshore wind, anti-renewable energy. And a lot of the information that was being shared in those groups um, was very memefied, very AI-driven, to be quite honest, um, content, images. Um, and it was found that a lot of the users in those groups actually didn't care if it was accurate or not. <coughs> They were just sharing it because they enjoyed it and they were part of those groups and it was something that they felt mildly passionate about. So I think if we can have more content that is not only accurate but representative of how those platforms are being used is going to be one, one small way that we can combat those issues. Um, but you know, that talking about civic organizations, how to, to maybe to Frederick to start, and then uh, sorry, not Frederick, Mark yeah. to start, and then Julie to uh, respond to. But how can civic organizations collaborate with local communities to raise awareness and build trust in renewable energy? That's a great question, and I promise this will be a much shorter answer. <laughs> um, so, how New Yorker News does it, and that's the example that I, that I can speak to. Um, our membership is based in communities all across New York State. Uh, there are 400 member organizations, and many of them are community-based organizations from Buffalo to the end of Long Island um, and from the Adirondacks. You know. So um, there's a whole collaborative process that goes on year-round, but particularly during the legislative session. Um, both to educate our base about what the issues are, what the solutions are, and then to mobilize people to write to their local legislators, write, email their local legislators, call their offices, have grassroots lobbying meetings. So we just, two weeks ago, we did 70 grassroots lobby meetings with state legislators. And that's all people in the assembly district of that assembly member speaking with their representative. So well, that's the short answer. So <clears throat> we're uh, part of an organization called Windworks New York, uh, which is now uh, started out as Windworks Long Island, and we're expanding to go statewide because um, a lot of a lot of the work obviously started on Long Island, but there's a lot more impact on offshore wind and opportunities. Um, we actually worked very successfully uh, with a hyper local group. Um, in East Hampton, which is where the first offshore wind project was located, um, to help provide them with information, to help make sure that we're getting educational programming out there, to help provide support for that local group, so that it's not just a statewide organization that's coming in and sort of big footing. You know, there's a lot of, uh, as many people know, outside of New York City, a lot of people don't like New York City to come in and tell them what to do. And so really, I think it's important to help collaborate with um, the local local groups to talk about the issues that are on the ground. Um, one of the things that we've been encouraging uh, developers to do as they're thinking about how are we going to get offshore wind done is to have community meetings with community members and not just the elected officials. 
right? Because the elected officials ultimately want to do what the community members want them to do. Um, and so if we're starting with the community as opposed to starting with the elected officials, I think you'll have a more successful program in how do you get what you want uh, out, of, out of a community um, or how can you successfully find strategies that work for both the community and the developer. So to me, that is something that is, is really important in everybody working together. Um, one of the, the broader strategies, and, and this is not necessarily about civic groups working with local groups, but is, is how labor and the environmental movement are now working in lockstep when it comes to renewable energy. And that makes it much more difficult for the, the, the higher up you are in p politics for them to say no uh, without having real serious and, and either consequences or um, having real earnest um, issues that need to be addressed before you tackle an issue, for example. So I think that having a greater diversity of the <coughs> types of groups, because it's not only you know, environmental groups, environmental justice groups, and labor groups that care about this, right? Civic organizations all over the place have an interest in what's happening in their communities, and this is a business development opportunity, so there are job opportunities related to that, which, by the way, the public doesn't believe in yet um, because they don't know anyone who's worked on offshore wind, they think, right? So it's how, how can we help mobilize more people in order to help get the word out to the general public because when your neighbor has worked in offshore wind or your neighbor has benefited because they're no longer breathing in that dirty pollution, I think people will have a much better understanding of things um, in order to be successful in advancing the industries and the projects that are necessary for us to achieve our renewable energy goals and our, our climate goals. Mm -hmm. I think kind of to summarize, it, it, it really comes down to trust. Like, the issue with misinformation is not that the information isn't out there. We know the information is out there. We have the scientists. We have the, the reports. We have the data. It comes down to trust and where people are willing to get their information and who they're willing to listen to. And so whether you're meeting with, you know, assembly members or working at the community level or working with business organizations in different sectors, it all comes down to creating a collaborative conversation and a conversation where they feel heard and you are able to say what you need to say. Um, trust is the is the the final say in that, I think. Um, so, you know, we've talked about, you, you both have mentioned some examples, um, but maybe we can kind of build on this more, um, where we've seen examples of individuals or coalitions effectively shifting public opinion to embrace just energy. Well, I think, I, I, I don't know, but we're, we're shifting it per se, although it's been a long time, because offshore wind's about 20 years in the making, right, and, we're, and to where we are now, um, thinking about that. Um, but we're certainly making sure that it stays positive, I think, on, on Long Island. We're helping to try and push back some of the opposition that has been out there with mixed success. Um, but it really has been about mobilizing people Right, you can't just talk about this at the at the state level when it comes to renewable energy. It is now on the ground, and getting people to community meetings has been really important. Mobilizing lots of people to have rallies beforehand, for example, making sure that you're getting people positive information. Like we've been holding a lot of webinars to educate people on various topics. Sometimes it's as basic as like a why wind works and what does it mean, what does it look like, how does it work, right? To the whale issue to battery energy storage, to various topics, really providing that information, having those trusted messengers out there to provide the information. You know, when we've done, when we did the whales, uh, whale tales and whale facts was the name of the, of the forum that we did. Um, you know, we had someone from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. We have someone from the Department of Environmental Conservation. We have someone from the Atlantic Marine. I'm going to screw up his name. Thank you. <laughs> the people who actually do um, the vivid sections of the whales when they have passed. Well, all right. What, the, the, yeah, the, yes, okay. <laughs> when they're dealing with the whales, the necropsies. Thank you. Thank you. You used that word before. That got in my head. Um, right, who are out there who are actually dealing with it so they could say definitively there's no evidence of this. So having those trusted messengers and understanding how we can pro provide factual information because people are, are, are interested in the misinformation because they don't have the facts. And so being transparent about that I think is a way to help address this issue. I think I've come off your question, but 
Um, <laughs> those are all things that I wanted to touch base on. Yeah. Well, I think I'm going to talk about one affordability, one of the one of the buzzwords, which um, we have a very concrete example happened last year, 2023, during the legislative session. Um, because the industry is always looking for opportunities to talk about how implementing the climate law is going to create an unaffordable scenario for, for families. Um, they uh, used their influence to get a bill introduced in the legislature, again, this was 2023. At, during, while the budget negotiations were going on and the way the budget works in New York State, there it's um, the governor puts forward her budget proposal and each house of the legislature puts forward their own budget proposals and then they get in a room together and they negotiate a compromise or a package that gets a straight up or down vote. Um, so, and the budget always passes because it's been negotiated by all the parties. So whatever goes into the budget then becomes law. It's a very, very critical moment in the legislative calendar. And last year, the fossil fuel industry uh, got a bill introduced that they said was about affordability because they said there's something in the climate law, I'm not going to go into the wonky details of it, but the methane is a greenhouse gas that is 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sorry. Um, and of course, methane is the chief component of natural gas. And so the industry wanted to, what, what we had gotten into the climate law when it passed in 2019 was based on the science. Um, and there's a lot of research about why you need to be accounting. That impact of methane is over a 20 year period, whereas carbon monoxide is calculated over a 100 year period. So the 20 year period was in the law and what the industry said is it's not gonna be affordable for households if you keep that 20 year accounting you need to change it to 100 years. And suddenly the governor got that message. We don't know exactly how, but we can guess. And she made that part, she brought that into the budget negotiations and wanted to change the accounting method. It would have effectively gutted one of the key parts of the, of the climate bill, the 2019 climate bill. So there was a huge mobilization. I think LCV was part of that. There were hundreds of organizations around the state that, um, some of it was behind the scenes with memos of opposition, and some of it was very, very much in the, in the public media. And that's where, because there was this instant reaction, literally within five days, all the media coverage was shifted from, this, from what the industry's version of affordability was to why this would be a terrible change in the bill. And the governor withdrew that proposal literally within five days after she put it on the table. So that's a very concrete example of how you can, if you can mobilize, now it was a defensive victory. It was keeping something bad from happening. It's much, much harder to move positive legislation forward. Well, I think on that note, for our last question, and then we'll turn it over to a very quick Q&A, um, <clears throat> is what policy changes or educational efforts are needed to dismantle the misinformation acceleration that's happening in the adoption of renewable energy? <laughs> well, there have been some questions about, like one of the, the biggest opponents of this New York Heat Act that Mark referenced is, is a utility, and they're using utility dollars in order, so basically you, you were paying, not we, because it's not Con Ed, but um, the, the rate payers are paying for uh, the ads that are being used to block this legislation. So I think one question is, is and, D, and the Department of Public Service is really taking a hard look at that and, and has actually punished the company for misuse of ratepayer dollars in some cases. Um, so that certainly is something that's out there. Um, honestly, I think this is not a policy, but I think the government actually needs to be out talking to the public more. 
Um, so that's like it's not a it's not a big P policy, but it's a it's a little P policy, right? Like when we're talking about offshore wind, like for a long time, NYSERDA has been reluctant to talk about it in communities. Once projects have been picked, they feel like it's the developers to do it, but developers have a profit motive, and you know, which is fine uh, from my perspective, but the 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 community may be wary of that because of that reason as opposed to having the government, which is supposed to be a little bit more authoritative and a little bit more dispassionate about it, um, more about trying to get the policy outcome as opposed to who gets the, how, how do they get it. Um, I think having them be more engaged um, and public, and I think they're working on that. There was sort of a, they're sort of being made fun of because they're, they're pursuing a, a public relations firm to help them with that uh, from the state perspective, but I do really think them talking about it more and what climate means is really important. I think having leaders like the governor and you mentioned elected officials before writing letters, but like having people talk about these issues is really critical. Like that's how you can sort of counterbalance uh, misinformation by you know expressing how much support you have for something from your elected leaders. Um, I think that's something certainly we put in our scorecards, for example, and we put in our endorsement questionnaires when we're asking people, but we ask them specifically about their position on offshore wind, for example, um, so that we know when we're making our endorsement decisions whether or not they're pro offshore wind, and really trying to mobilize people so because they have they have voices. They are in the public a lot. They're elected officials. You always want an elected official at your press event, right, if you can, because you're more likely to get the press if you have an elected official there. So it's really a big way to engage the public. Um, so to me, that that is really critical, um, is really using the, the bully pulpit of the elected officials to help to get the message out and to help to counterbalance misinformation. Now, of course, it goes the other way. We have the liar in chief, um, you know, over across town, um, you know, dealing with his own problems. But like, should we have that another presidency like that? We will have to deal with people who are are more persuaded to spread misinformation and and undermine this new emerging industry in in our country. Um, at least offshore winds is new and emerging. Solar is going strong, onshore wind is going strong. Um, so I think we do need to, to get get elected officials out there just because if nothing else, they have the press, but in the case of the executive, they also have the power of the regulation and the permitting and the pocketbook. And so making sure that they're all swimming in the right direction I think is really key. Yeah, I think uh, one thing to just kind of build on that if we're talking like big dream Big dreams, <laughs> I think, is also just the the policy around um, information sharing in general. So misinformation, regardless of the industry that it's talking about or political stance. So like that article I was talking about earlier with the Facebook groups, um, Facebook was interviewed for that, and they're aware of the misinformation, and they actually don't care um, because it has to do with how many eyes are on it. And so they will, they have chosen not to adjust their algorithm unless enough people have flagged a certain item as total misinformation. Um, so I think that there does need to be some pressure from the government as well on these mm -hmm. information sharing agencies, regardless of what information they're sharing. So I'd like to leave enough time to, for oh, questions. Yeah. So All I right. think <laughs> answered the question very well. I don't, I don't need to add to that. So. Great. All right. Well, at this time, then we'll turn it over to the crowd. I see a couple hands already. So the first hand was in the very back. come up with a homeowner cost savings argument for these renewable energy um, options or alternatives? How can I as a homeowner see this in my electric bill that my you know rates are going down? Because I think when we know that there's lots of costs associated with obviously investing in the transition, so how do we counterbalance that with you're going to save money through XYZ means. All right, so there's there's a couple of things. Like one is you have no idea what you're, like, let's say you use natural gas now for heating and for cooking, right? You have absolutely no idea what that gas is going to cost you a year from now, six months from now, three years from now, right? With renewables, once they're constructed, the cost is basically the same for the next 25 years. 
Um, and so it's not necessarily that costs are going to go down. I'm not going to tell you that your costs are going to go down from having offshore wind. Your costs are, in fact, going to go up. They're going to go up by like $2 a month, right? Um, <clears throat> but but I, what I can tell you is that it will be stable, um, and it will be American, and it will not be reliant on global markets, um, which is the way it is now for uh, for all petroleum products. We're really on the roller coaster ride of the fossil fuel industry, of these geopolitical forces. Um, whether or not that gas is coming from the United States, like the, the actual pricing is done on a global scale as opposed to renewables, which are much more localized, even if the markets of the materials are, are broader. For New York Heat, it's also interesting in that like we're gonna stop paying so that right now, if you want to add gas to your house, all of us pay for that, right? So that is something that we've been working on trying to educate people about, that it will reduce the cost because I'm not paying for my neighbor to have gas added that they don't have right now, right? Because that's how that works today to the tune of 200 plus million dollars a year. Um, and that's across the entire state. So trying to figure that out. I, it's, not, it's not as easy to get right at a you're gonna it's gonna go down x amount of dollars for a lot of things some things there are like energy efficiency 100 percent you're gonna you know you make this investment you're gonna cut your cost but it's it's i think it's harder to do on a global scale but you mark i don't know if you have other no i think you answered it very well i mean i, I it's you know it's it's hard to quantify these things in a way that's honest you can throw a lot of numbers around we try not to be doing what the industry is doing. Um, but I, you know, I, I think the way Julie frames it is actually it makes total sense, which is what you have is very, very volatile prices. When, as long as you're dependent on fossil fuels, you can't control those prices. There's no way to control them. As soon as you begin shifting over to renewable energy, you, there's a co fixed cost of installing that, and from then on, there are really negligible additional costs. It doesn't mean you're not paying for to get electricity from solar or wind, but it just means that's predictable for years to come. So, and that's the, the when the industry makes this case for affordability, they're not even talking about, like particularly the gas utilities, they're in the process right now of asking the Public Service Commission for rate hikes, and partly to cover those costs that Julie was talking about. So National Grid, for example, which services Brooklyn, Queen, parts of Brooklyn, Queens, Long Island, their rate hikes will cost homeowners $35 a month just in the first year, right? Part of that is for that gas infrastructure. So we need to take that away. I'll stop there. Cool. And I, mean, I think, do think it's important, Mark touched on something, right? There are people out there who have no qualms about putting out false information, like patently false information, and that is something that the environmental industry, um, the environmental sector is not willing to do. That's so true. I do want to just call attention to, I don't know if you guys saw the lawsuit in California in September, um, but the state of California is suing Exxon for spreading misinformation. So it's not even about the use of fossil fuels, it is specifically about the information that they were giving to the public. Um, and so I do think that we are hopefully starting to see a turn of uh, holding these companies accountable for, for their lies, their I, blatant I, lies. I was thinking that you know, we don't, you don't see tobacco ads anymore, right? Yeah. You don't see tobacco ads, and I was thinking about that with, with respect to fossil fuels. Yeah. And that took decades right. to get to that point, yeah. and, the, and of course the tobacco industry was spending hundreds of millions of dollars to fight that every, every step of the way, yeah. until public opinion got to the point where it was impossible to defend that anymore. All right, I think we have time for one more question. I see a very eager hand, so. <laughs> <laughs> Having run the second, the largest fuel buyers group in the country or in the state in the last war, in the oil war in the 90s, um, you didn't talk about home heating oil. Hmm. You talked only about gas. And mm -hmm. I think there's a similar analogy there that you might want to include. You want to talk about that? Well, so it's interesting. So um, you may not know this. <clears throat> New York State has the dubious um, credit of having the number one, we're the number one user of heating oil in the country. 
Um, I think most people don't expect that. Um, you know, you think about your building, but there's a lot. Of, and I, I, coming from DEC, um, I used to think it was like an upstate issue, right? No, it's not. <laughs> it's actually more used downstate by these very massive buildings that are using heating oil. And, and we've gradually been moving to cleaner heating oil, right, by getting rid of the dirtiest heating oil. Um, and really pushing back on that. And right now there's, there's a move to move, like, how, like Vermont actually passed a clean heating law that requires all that fuel to be now, uh, eventually will be renewable fuels, because uh, there are renewable uh, diesel fuels that are out there that can be substituted for this. Um, and of course, in the issuance right now, it's the idea of people are like, well, we can't get off of oil if you're not gonna let us get onto gas because of New York heat. And you're like, okay, but you can just skip that and go straight to heat pumps and electric and geothermal. There's other alternatives out there right now. So certainly we have, have pushed back from that, although I, I do think that industry is starting to moderate, at least to move to renewable fuels. Um, but that is not, you know, not everyone is comfortable with that. Um, but certainly that has been, that has been a big issue. Um, and, and it is shocking that, to me, still, New York is still the number one user of heating oil in the country. Wow. Well, I hate to end on that, but... <laughs> there was one more question. <laughs> All right, we'll do one more. <laughs> a specific question. Do you, do you know if anyone is planning to make a, uh, any sort of video or information about one of these big offshore wind projects once they get going, either either Vineyard or, or Sunrise or something? Because I, you know, I, I, I give a, a offshore wind 101. I've given it about 20 times. I've heard every crazy idea, uh, every conspiracy theory, and... I think until we have a, a project we can show a video of and show that it's not on fire and show that there's not dead whales floating around it and show that people are fishing right through it, um, I think that'll be a huge difference. I'm hoping someone with money is thinking about this and is going to be out there immediately. Me too. Well, <laughs> certainly, I mean, Orsted has done a few for, uh, for South Fork, obviously. South Fork is only 13 turbines. Right. Yeah. No. Um, and not yet. I will say this. I think obviously the, the news has done some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we can work on that. <laughs> we can certainly work on that. We are getting ready to do not videos, but we are getting ready to do a big canvassing effort to help mobilize more people because we do think right now, and we know this from polling, right? People are more people support offshore wind than oppose it or even have questions about it. And that is true across every sector except Republican men over 45 upstate New York, right? Literally everywhere else, they're at least 50% in favor, right? So it's a very small group of people that is opposed to offshore wind. Um, and even then, most of them, they just need more information. Um, so there is a lot of opportunity. More people out there support it, but they don't do anything about it. So my experience as a regulator was that more people come out when they're opposed to something than when they're for something, right? And so how can we get more people activated to be like, no, no, I don't actually want that Barrett power plant in my neighborhood. I want there to be clean energy in my neighborhood. And how can we reduce that pollution associated with this? And how can we get the revenue from the taxes associated with this? And how can we know that our children are going to breathe better? Which I think goes back to Mark's original point was needing to tell better stories and more stories about why the renewable energy transformation that we're going to see in the next coming decades is something that it's worth paying for, right? Are you willing to pay $2 a month more than you pay now so that your kid doesn't have asthma? I think that's pretty compelling. Okay, and on that note, <laughs> unfortunately, we do actually need to end. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us for this uh, conversation on misinformation. Um, we've got our closing plenary happening in Safra Hall. So feel free to make your way out, grab a quick water, and then we will wrap up this awesome day. Thank you. Thank you.